Brought to you by wikivd.com. Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action The Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action known commonly as the Iran Deal or Iran Nuclear Deal is an international agreement on the nuclear program of Iran reached in Vienna on 14 July 2015 between Iran, the P-51 and the European Union. Formal negotiations toward the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action on Iran's nuclear program began with the adoption of the Joint Plan of Action an interim agreement signed between Iran and the P-51 countries in November 2013. For the next 20 months Iran and the P-51 countries engaged in negotiations and in April 2015 agreed on an Iran nuclear deal framework for the final agreement. And in July 2015 Iran and the P-51 agreed on the plan. Under the agreement Iran agreed to eliminate its stockpile of medium-enriched uranium cut its stockpile of low-enriched uranium by 98% and reduce by about two-thirds the number of its gas centrifuges for 13 years. For the next 15 years Iran will only enrich uranium up to 3.67%. Iran also agreed not to build any new heavy water facilities for the same period of time. Uranium enrichment activities will be limited to a single facility using first-generation centrifuges for 10 years. Other facilities will be converted to avoid proliferation risks. To monitor and verify Iran's compliance with the agreement, the International Atomic Energy Agency will have regular access to all Iranian nuclear facilities. The agreement provides that in return for verifiably abiding by its commitments Iran will receive relief from U.S. European Union and United Nations Security Council nuclear-related economic sanctions. On October 13, 2017 U.S. President Donald Trump announced that the United States would not make the certification provided for under U.S. domestic law but stopped short of terminating the deal. Background a nuclear weapon uses a fissile material to cause a nuclear chain reaction. The most commonly used materials have been uranium-235 and plutonium-239. Both uranium-233 and reactor-grade plutonium have also been used. The amount of uranium or plutonium needed depends on the sophistication of the design. With a simple design requiring approximately 15 kg of uranium or 6 kg of plutonium, and a sophisticated design requiring as little as 9 kg of uranium or 2 kg of plutonium, plutonium is almost non-existent in nature and natural uranium is about 99.3% uranium-238 and 0.7% U-235. Therefore to make a weapon either uranium must be enriched, or plutonium must be produced. Uranium enrichment is also frequently necessary for nuclear power. For this reason, uranium enrichment is a dual-use technology, a technology which can be used both for civilian and for military purposes. Key strategies to prevent proliferation of nuclear arms include limiting the number of operating uranium enrichment plants and controlling the export of nuclear technology and fissile material. Iranian development of nuclear technology began in the 1970s when the U.S. Atoms for Peace program began providing assistance to Iran which was then led by the Shah. Iran signed the Treaty on the Non-Proliferation of Nuclear Weapons in 1968 as a non-nuclear weapons state and ratified the NPT in 1970. In 1979 the Iranian Revolution took place, and Iran's nuclear program which had developed some baseline capacity fell to disarray as much of Iran's nuclear talent fled the country in the wake of the revolution. Ayatollah Rahola Khomeini was initially opposed to nuclear technology, 
and Iran engaged in a costly war with Iraq from 1980 to 1988. Starting in the later 1980s, Iran restarted its nuclear program with assistance from Pakistan, China and Russia and from the AQ Khan network. Iran began pursuing an indigenous nuclear fuel cycle capability by developing a uranium mining infrastructure and experimenting with uranium conversion and enrichment. According to the nonpartisan nuclear threat initiative U.S., intelligence agencies have long suspected Iran of using its civilian nuclear program as a cover for clandestine weapons development. Iran, in contrast, has always insisted that its nuclear work is peaceful. In August 2002, the Paris Space National Council of Resistance of Iran, an Iranian dissident group, publicly revealed the existence of two undeclared nuclear facilities, the Arak Heavy Water Production Facility and the Natanz Enrichment Facility. In February 2003, Iranian President Mohammad Khatami acknowledged the existence of the facilities, and asserted that Iran had undertaken small-scale enrichment experiments to produce low-enriched uranium for nuclear power plants. In late February, International Atomic Energy Agency inspectors visited Natanz. In May 2003, Iran allowed IAEA inspectors to visit the Calais Electric Company but refused to allow them to take samples and an IAEA report the following month concluded that Iran had failed to meet its obligations under the previous agreement. In June 2003 Iran faced with the prospect of being referred to the UN Security Council entered into diplomatic negotiations with France, Germany and the United Kingdom. The United States refused to be involved in these negotiations. In October 2003 the Tehran Declaration was reached between Iran and the EU3. Under this declaration Iran agreed to cooperate fully with the IAEA sign the additional protocol and temporarily suspend all uranium enrichment. In September and October 2003, the IAEA conducted several facility inspections. This was followed by the Paris Agreement in November 2004 in which Iran agreed to temporarily suspend enrichment and conversion activities, including the manufacture installation testing an operation of centrifuges and committed to working with EU3 to find a mutually beneficial long-term diplomatic solution. In August 2005 Mahmoud Ahmadinejad, a hardliner was elected president of Iran. He accused Iranian negotiators who had negotiated the Paris Accords of Treason. Over the next two months the EU3 agreement fell apart as talks over the EU3's proposed long-term agreement broke down, the Iranian government felt that the proposal was heavy on demands light on incentives, did not incorporate Iran's proposals and violated the Paris Agreement. Iran notified the IAEA that it would resume uranium conversion at Esfahan. In February 2006, Iran ended its voluntary implementation of the additional protocol and resumed enrichment at Natanz prompting the IAEA Board of Governors to refer Iran to the UN Security Council. After the vote Iran announced it would resume enrichment of uranium. In April 2006, Ahmadinejad announced that Iran had nuclear technology but stated that it was purely for power generation and not for producing weapons. In June 2006 the EU3 joined China-Russia and the United States to form the P-51. The following month, July 2006, the UN Security Council passed its first resolution demanding Iran stop uranium enrichment and processing. Altogether from 2006 to 2010, the UN Security Council subsequently adopted six resolutions concerning Iran's nuclear program, 1696, 
1929. The legal authority for the IAEA Board of Governors referral and the Security Council resolutions was derived from the IAEA statute and the United Nations Charter. The resolutions demanded that Iran cease enrichment activities, and imposed sanctions on Iran including bans on the transfer of nuclear and missile technology to the country and freezes on the assets of certain Iranian individuals and entities in order to pressure the country. However in Resolution 1803 and elsewhere the Security Council Council also acknowledged Iran's rights under Article 4 of the NPT, which provides for the inalienable right to develop research production and use of nuclear energy for peaceful purposes. In July 2006, Iran opened the Arak heavy water production plant which led to one of the Security Council resolutions. In September 2009 U.S. President Barack Obama revealed the existence of an underground enrichment facility in Fall Down near Om, saying, Iran's decision to build yet another nuclear facility without notifying the IAEA represents a direct challenge to the basic compact at the center of the non-proliferation regime. Israel threatened to take military action against Iran. In a February 2007 interview with the Financial Times, IAEA Director General Mohammad El Barade said that military action against Iran would be catastrophic, counterproductive, and called for negotiations between the international community and Iran over the Iranian nuclear program. El Barade specifically proposed a double simultaneous suspension, a timeout as a confidence-building measure under which the international sanctions would be suspended and Iran would suspend enrichment. El Barade also said if I look at it from a weapons perspective there are much more important issues to me than the suspension of enrichment, naming his top priorities as preventing Iran from going to industrial capacity until the issues are settled, building confidence with full inspection, involving Iranian adoption of the additional protocol, and at all costs preventing Iran from moving out of the treaty-based non-proliferation system. A November 2007 U.S. National Intelligence Estimate assessed that Iran halted its nuclear weapons program in 2003. That estimate and subsequent U.S. intelligence community statements also assessed that the Iranian government at the time had was keeping open the option to develop nuclear weapons in the future. A July 2015 Congressional Research Service report said statements from the U.S. intelligence community indicate that Iran has the technological and industrial capacity to produce nuclear weapons at some point but the U.S. government assesses that Tehran has not mastered all of the necessary technologies for building a nuclear weapon. In March 2013, the United States began a series of secret bilateral talks with Iranian officials in Oman led by William Joseph Burns and Jake Sullivan on the American side and Ali Asghar Khaji on the Iranian side. In June 2013, Hassan Rouhani was elected president of Iran. Rouhani has been described as more moderate, pragmatic and willing to negotiate than Ahmadinejad. However, in a 2006 nuclear negotiation with European powers, Rouhani said that Iran had used the negotiations to dupe the Europeans saying that during the negotiations Iran managed to master the conversion of uranium yellow cake at Isfahan. The conversion of yellow cake is an important step in the nuclear fuel process. In August 2013, three days after his inauguration, Rouhani called for a resumption of serious negotiations with the P-51 on the Iranian nuclear program.
In September 2013 Obama and Rouhani had a telephone conversation, the first high-level contact between U.S. and Iranian leaders since 1979 and U.S. Secretary of State John Kerry had a meeting with Iranian Foreign Minister Mohammad Javad Zarif, signaling that the two countries had an opening to cooperation. After several rounds of negotiations on 24 November 2013 the Joint Plan of Action, an interim agreement on the Iranian nuclear program was signed between Iran and the P-51 countries in Geneva, Switzerland. It consisted of a short-term freeze of portions of Iran's nuclear program in exchange for decreased economic sanctions on Iran as the countries worked towards a long-term agreement. The IAEA began more intrusive and frequent inspections under this interim agreement. The agreement was formally activated on 20 January 2014. On that day, the IAEA issued a report stating that Iran was adhering to the terms of the interim agreement, including stopping enrichment of uranium to 20% beginning the dilution process, and halting work on the Arak heavy water reactor. A major focus on the negotiations was limitations on Iran's key nuclear facilities, the Iraq IR-40 heavy water reactor and production plant not to commission a fuel the reactor. The Bush Air nuclear power plant, the Gatchen uranium mine, the Ford Al fuel enrichment plant, the Isfahan uranium conversion plant, the Natanz uranium enrichment plant, and the Parchan military research and development complex. Negotiations The agreement between the P-51EU and Iran on the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action is the culmination of 20 months of arduous negotiations. The agreement followed the Joint Plan of Action, an interim agreement between the P-51 powers in Iran that was agreed to on 24 November 2013. At Geneva, the Geneva Agreement was an interim deal in which Iran agreed to roll back parts of its nuclear program in exchange for relief from some sanctions. This went into effect on 20 January 2014. The parties agreed to extend their talks, with a first extension deadline on 24 November 2014 and a second extension deadline set to 1 July 2015. An Iran nuclear deal framework was reached on 2 April 2015. Under this framework Iran agreed tentatively to accept restrictions on its nuclear program, all of which would last for at least a decade and some longer and to submit to an increased intensity of international inspections under a framework deal. These details were to be negotiated by the end of June 2015. The negotiations toward a joint comprehensive plan of action were extended several times until the final agreement. The joint comprehensive plan of action was finally reached on 14 July 2015. The JCPOA is based on the framework agreement from three months earlier. Subsequently the negotiations between Iran and the P-51 continued. In April 2015, a framework deal was reached at Lausanne, and tense marathon negotiations then continued, with the last session in Vienna at the Palais Coburg lasting for 17 days. At several points, negotiations appeared to be at risk of breaking down but negotiators managed to come to agreement. As the negotiators neared a deal U.S. Secretary of State John Kerry directly asked Iranian Foreign Minister Mohammad Javad Zarif to confirm that he was authorized to actually make a deal not just by the Iranian president but by the supreme leader. Zarif gave assurances that he was ultimately on 14 July 2015. All parties agreed to a landmark comprehensive nuclear agreement. At the time of the announcement, shortly before 11 o'clock Greenwich Mean Time the agreement was released to the public. The final agreement's complexity shows the impact of a public letter written 
by a bipartisan group of 19 U.S. diplomats, experts and others in June 2015 written when negotiations were still going on. That letter outlined concerns about the several provisions in the then-unfinished agreement and called for a number of improvements to strengthen the prospective agreement and win there was support for it. After the final agreement was reached one of the signatories, Robert J. Einhorn, a former U.S. Department of State official now at the Brookings Institution, said of the agreement, Analysts will be pleasantly surprised. The more things are agreed to, the less opportunity there is for implementation difficulties later on. The final agreement is based upon the rules-based non-proliferation regime created by the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty and including especially the IAEA Safeguard System. Summary of Provisions The Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action runs to 109 pages including five annexes. Major provisions of the final accord include the following. Nuclear as a result of the above the breakout time, the time in which it would be possible for Iran to make enough material for a single nuclear weapon, will increase from two to three months to one year according to U.S. officials and U.S. intelligence. An August 2015 report published by a group of experts at Harvard University's Belfer Center for Science and international affairs concurs in these estimates writing that under the JCPOA, over the next decade would be extended to roughly a year, from the current estimated breakout time of two to three months. The Center for Arms Control and Non-Proliferation also accepts these estimates. By contrast Alan J. Cooperman coordinator of the Nuclear Proliferation Prevention Project at the University of Texas at Austin, disputed the one-year assessment arguing that under the agreement Iran's breakout time would be only about three months not much longer than it is today. The longer breakout time would be in place for at least ten years, after that point, the breakout time would gradually decrease. By the 15th year U.S. Officials state that the breakout time would return to the pre-JCPOA status quo of a few months. The Belfer Center report states, Some contributors to this report believe that breakout time by year 15 could be comparable to what it is today a few months while others believe it could be reduced to a few weeks. Exemptions Reuters reported that exemptions were granted to Iran prior to 16 January 2016. The reported purpose of the exemptions was so that sanctions relief and other benefits could start by that date instead of Iran being in violation. The exemptions included Iran able to exceed the 300 kg of 3.5% LEU limit in the agreement. Iran able to exceed the 0 kg of 20% LEU limit in the agreement. Iran to keep operating 19 hot cells that exceed the size limit in the agreement. Iran to maintain control of 50 tons of heavy water that exceed the 130 ton limit in the agreement. By storing the excess at an Iran controlled facility in Oman in December 2016. The IAEA published decisions of the Joint Commission that spell out these clarifications of the JCPOA. Sanctions The following provisions regarding sanctions are written into the JCPOA. Ankit Panda of the Diplomat states that this will make impossible any scenario where Iran is non-compliant with the JCPOA yet escapes re-imposition of sanctions. Mark Doublewitz of the Foundation for Defense of Democracies argues however that, because the JCPOA provides that Iran could treat reinstatement of sanctions as grounds for leaving the agreement the United States would be reluctant to impose a snapback. For smaller violations, the only thing you'll take to the Security Council are massive Iranian violations because you're certainly not going 
to risk the Iranians walking away from the deal and engaging in nuclear escalation over smaller violations. Records According to several commentators, JCPOA is the first of its kind in the annals of non-proliferation and is in many aspects unique. This is the first time that the United Nations Security Council has recognized the nuclear enrichment program of a developing country and backs an agreement signed by several countries within the framework of a resolution. For the first time in the history of the United Nations a country Iran was able to abolish six UN resolutions against it 1696, 1737, 1747, 1803, 1835, 1929 without even one day of implementing them. Sanctions against Iran was also lifted, for the first time. Throughout the history of international law this is the first and only time that a country subject to Chapter 7 of the United Nations Charter has managed to end its case and stop being subject to this chapter through diplomacy. All other cases have ended through either regime change war, or full implementation of the Security Council's decisions by the country. During the final negotiations U.S. Secretary of State John Kerry stayed in Vienna for 17 days, making him the top American official devoting time to a single international negotiation in more than four decades. Mohammad Javad Zarif broke the record of an Iranian foreign minister being far from home with 18 days stay in Vienna and set the record of 106 days of negotiations in 687 days, a number higher than any other chief nuclear negotiator in 12 years. The negotiations became the longest continuous negotiations, with the presence of all foreign ministers of the permanent members of the United Nations Security. Council. The negotiations included rare events in Iran-United States relations not only since the 1979 Iranian Revolution but also in the history of the bilateral relations. The U.S. Secretary of State and Iranian Foreign Minister met on 18 different dates sometimes multiple occasions a day and in 11 different cities unprecedented since the beginning of the relations. On 27 April 2015, John Kerry visited the official residence of the permanent representative of Iran to the United Nations which counts as Iranian soil to meet his counterpart. The encounter was the first of its kind since the Iran hostage crisis. On the sidelines of the 70th session of the United Nations General Assembly U.S., President Barack Obama shook hands with the Iranian Foreign Minister Javad Zarif, marking the first such event in history. The event was also noted in form of diplomatic ranks, as a head of state shook hands with a minister. Obama is reported to have said in the meeting, Too much effort has been put into the JCPOA and we all should be diligent to implement it. Political and diplomatic reactions There was a significant worldwide response following the announcement of the agreement. More than 90 countries endorsed the agreement as did many international organizations. Expert reactions Following the unveiling of the agreement a general consensus quickly emerged among nuclear experts and watchdogs that the agreement is as close to a best-case situation as reality would allow. In August 2015 75 arms control and nuclear non-proliferation experts signed a statement endorsing the deal as a net plus for international nuclear non-proliferation efforts that exceeds the historical standards for arms control agreements, the Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists invited top international security experts to comment on the final agreement. In popular culture, the American TV series Madam Secretary built a whole season around the negotiations. 
Five years before the deal in 24's season 8 the negotiations between the United States leaders and President Hassan of Islamic Republic of Kamistan to abandon his nuclear technology program was shown which drew comparison to the U.S.-Iran dispute. However the deal was contrarily to Homeland's season 3 plot that fueled nuclear paranoia against Iran. After the deal, a joke began circulating in Iran that the name of city of Iraq would change to Barak in honor of Obama and that in return the United States would change the name of Manhattan Borough to Mash Hassan, which is a very casual way of referring to Rouhani. Javad Zarif's efforts in the negotiations drew comparisons to mythological Arash the Archer and two former prime ministers, Mohammad Mosadi, who led the withdrawal of foreigners and nationalization of the Iran oil industry and was overthrown by American-British coup d'etat because both fought foreigners for Iran's rights, and Amir Kabir, because both faced domestic hostility through their way to gain more interest for the nation. United States Nationwide Public polling on the issue has yielded varied and sometimes contradictory results. Depending on the question wording whether the poll explains the provisions of the agreement and whether an undecided option is offered, polls have consistently shown polarization by party affiliation with majorities of self-identified Democrats supporting the agreement and majorities of self-identified Republicans opposing it incorporated into international law by the United Nations Security Council. As provided for in the JCPOA, the agreement was formally endorsed by the UN Security Council, incorporating it into international law. There was initially disagreement on if the deal is legally binding on the United States. The U.S. State Department clarified this in a 19 November 2015 letter to Congress stating, The Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action is not a treaty or an executive agreement, and is not a signed document. The JCPOA reflects political commitments between Iran, the P-51, and the EU. According to the State Department, political commitments are non-binding. On 15 July 2015 the American ambassador to the UN Samantha Power circulated a 14-page draft to council members. On 20 July 2015, the Security Council unanimously approved the 14-page resolution, United Nations Security Council Resolution 2231, in a 15-0 vote. The resolution delays its official implementation for 90 days to allow for U.S. congressional consideration under the Iran Nuclear Agreement Review Act of 2015. The resolution lays out the steps for terminating sanctions imposed by seven past Security Council resolutions but retains an arms embargo and ballistic missile technology ban. The resolution also did not affect the sanctions imposed separately by the United States and the European Union. The resolution also codifies the snapback mechanism of the agreement, under which all Security Council sanctions will be automatically reimposed if Iran breaches the deal. Speaking immediately after the vote, Power told the Security Council that sanctions relief would start only when Iran verifiably met its obligations. Power also called upon Iran to immediately release all unjustly detained Americans, specifically naming Amir Hekmati, Saeed Abedini, and Jason Reze, and were imprisoned by Iran, was detained at the time, and Robert A. Levinson, who has been missing in the country. Hekmati Abedini and Rezaian were subsequently released in a January 2016 prisoner exchange, which Secretary of State Kerry said had been accelerated by the nuclear agreement approved by European Union. On the same day that the Security Council approved a resolution 
the European Union formally approved the JCPOA via a vote of the EU Foreign Affairs Council meeting in Brussels. This sets into motion the lifting of certain EU sanctions, including those prohibiting the purchase of Iranian oil. The EU continues its sanctions relating to human rights and its sanctions prohibiting the export of ballistic missile technology. The approval by the EU was seen as a signal to the U.S. Congress. Review period in the United States Congress Under U.S. law the JCPOA is a non-binding political commitment. According to the U.S., State Department it specifically is not an executive agreement or a treaty. There are widespread incorrect reports that it is an executive agreement. In contrast to treaties, which require two-thirds of the Senate to consent to ratification, political commitments require no congressional approval and are not legally binding. Under the terms of the Iran Nuclear Agreement Review Act of 2015, which was signed into law on the 22nd of May 2015. The agreement is undergoing a 60-day review in the United States Congress. Under the Act, once all documents have been sent to the Capitol, Congress will have 60 days in which it can pass a resolution of approval. A resolution of disapproval or do nothing. President Obama has said he will veto any resolution of disapproval. Thus, Republicans will only be able to defeat the deal if they can muster the two-thirds of both houses of Congress needed to override a veto of any resolution of disapproval. This means that 34 votes in the Senate could sustain a veto and place the JCPOA into effect. On 19 July 2015 the State Department officially transmitted to Congress the JCPOA its annexes and related materials. These documents include the Unclassified Verification Assessment Report on the JCPOA, and the Intelligence Community's Classified Annex to the Verification Assessment Report. The 60-day review period began the next day, 20 July, and will end 17 September. On 30 July, Senator Ted Cruz introduced a resolution seeking a delay in the review period, arguing that the 60-day congressional review under the Act should not begin until the Senate obtains a copy of all bilateral Iran IAEA documents. Obama administration The international community has long sought a landmark diplomatic agreement with Iran on its nuclear program and such an agreement was also a long-sought foreign policy goal of the Obama administration. In comments made in the East Room of the White House on 15 July 2015, President Obama urged Congress to support the agreement saying if we don't choose wisely, I believe future generations will judge us harshly for letting this moment slip away. Obama stated that the inspections regime in the agreement was among the most vigorous ever. Negotiated and criticized opponents of the deal for failing to offer a viable alternative to it. Obama stated, if 99% of the world's community and the majority of nuclear experts look at this thing and they say, this will prevent Iran from getting a nuclear bomb and you are arguing either that it does not, then you should have some alternative to present. And I haven't heard that. The same day Obama made a case for the deal on the agreement in an interview with New York Times columnist Thomas Friedman. Obama stated, also on 15 July Vice President Joe Biden met with Senate Democrats on the Foreign Relations Committee on Capitol Hill where he made a presentation on the agreement. On 18 July Obama devoted his weekly radio address to the agreement stating this deal will make America and the world safer and more secure, and rebutting a lot of overheated and often dishonest arguments about it. Obama stated, As Commander-in-Chief I make no apology for keeping this country safe.
and secure through the hard work of diplomacy over the easy rush to war. On 23 July, President Obama met in the White House cabinet room with about a dozen undecided House Democrats to speak about the agreement and seek their support. The debate over the agreement has been marked by acrimony between the White House and with Republicans inside and outside of Congress. Senator Ted Cruz of Texas said that under the agreement, the Obama administration will become the leading financier of terrorism against America in the world. Former Governor Mike Huckabee of Arkansas, a candidate for the Republican presidential nomination, called the president naive and repeatedly invoked the Holocaust, saying that the president's policy would take the Israelis and march them to the door of the oven. This comparison was denounced by the Anti-Defamation League, the National Jewish Democratic Council, and various Israeli government officials. At a 27 June news conference, Obama specifically criticized Huckabee Cruz and Cotton, saying that such remarks were just part of a general pattern we've seen that would be considered ridiculous if it weren't so sad, especially from leaders in the Republican Party. Obama stated that, flinging out ad hominem attacks like that, doesn't help inform the American people, and stated, this is a deal that has been endorsed by people like Brent Scowcroft and Sam Nunn. Historic Democratic and Republican leaders on arms control and on keeping America safe. And so, when you get rhetoric like this maybe it gets attention and maybe this is just an effort to push Mr. Trump out of the headlines but it's not the kind of leadership that is needed for America right now. On 5 August Obama gave a speech before an audience of around 200 at American University marking a new phase in the administration's campaign for the agreement. Obama stated, let's not mince words, the choice we face is ultimately between diplomacy and some form of war maybe not tomorrow, maybe not three months from now, but soon. How can we in good conscience justify war before we've tested a diplomatic agreement that achieves our objectives? In his speech Obama also invoked a speech made by John F. Kennedy at American University in 1963 in favor of the Partial Nuclear Test Ban Treaty. Obama also said that the opponents of the agreement were the same people who created the drumbeat of war that led to the Iraq War and criticized knee-jerk partisanship that has become all too familiar rhetoric that renders every decision made to be a disaster a surrender. New York Senator Chuck Schumer, a senior Democrat, made a different assessment of prospects for war by distinguishing between nuclear and non-nuclear aspects of the agreement. In each case he asked whether we are better off with the agreement or without it and his conclusion was, when it comes to the nuclear aspects of the agreement within 10 years we might be slightly better off with it. However when it comes to the nuclear aspects after 10 years and the non-nuclear aspects, we would be better off without it. Then Schumer assessed the Iranian government saying who's to say this dictatorship will not prevail for another 10, 20 or 30 years? To me, the very real risk that Iran will not moderate and will instead use the agreement to pursue its nefarious goals is too great. And finally Schumer concluded, I will vote to disapprove the agreement not because I believe war is a viable or desirable option nor to challenge the path of diplomacy. It is because I believe Iran will not change. And under this agreement it will be able to achieve its dual goals of eliminating sanctions while ultimately retaining its nuclear and non-nuclear power. In the same speech Obama stated, just because Iranian hardliners chant death to America does not mean that that's what all Iranians believe. In fact, it's those hardliners who are most comfortable with the status quo. It's those hardliners chanting death to America who have been most opposed to the deal. They're making common cause with the Republican caucus. 
This statement was criticized by congressional Republican leaders. Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell called it crass political rhetoric that was a strategy to demonize your opponents, gin up the base, get the Democrats all angry and rally around the president. McConnell said, this is an enormous national security debate that the president will leave behind. Under the Constitution a year and a half from now and the rest of us will be dealing with the consequences of it. So I wish he would tone down the rhetoric and let's talk about the facts and promise that Republicans would discuss the agreement respectfully in September. Republican Senator Bob Corker, the chairman of Foreign Relations Committee, asserted that the president was trying to shut down debate by saying that those who have legitimate questions legitimate questions are somehow unpatriotic, are somehow compared to hardliners in Iran. The president subsequently stood by his statement, with White House Press Secretary Josh Ernest calling it a statement of fact, and the president saying in an interview, Remember, what I said was that it's the hardliners in Iran who are most opposed to this deal. And I said, in that sense they're making common cause with those who are opposed to this deal here. I didn't say that they were equivalent. In the same interview Obama said, a sizable proportion of the Republicans were opposed before the ink was even dry on the deal. In comments made at the Aspen Security Forum in Aspen, Colorado in July 2015, Director of National Intelligence James Clapper said that the JCPOA will improve the U.S. ability to monitor Iran, saying, the agreement puts us in a far better place in terms of insight and access than no agreement. While Clapper remains concerned about compliance and deceit but pointed out that during the negotiation period, Iran complied with rules negotiated under the interim agreement public debate. An intense public debate in the United States took place during the Congressional Review period. Some of the wealthiest and most powerful donors in American politics those for and against the accord became involved in the public debate although mega-donors opposing the agreement have contributed substantially more money than those supporting it. From 2010 to early August 2015 the foundations of Sheldon Adelson, Paul Singer, and Haim Saban contributed a total of $13 million to advocacy groups opposing an agreement with Iran. On the other side three groups lobbying in support of the agreement have received at least $803,000 from the Plowshares Fund, at least $425,000 from the Rockefeller Brothers Fund, and at least $68,500 from George Soros and his foundation. Other philanthropists and donors supporting an agreement include S. Daniel Abraham, Tim Gill, Norman Lear, Margarita Bankin and Arnold Heert, many Iranian Americans, even those who fled repression in Iran, and oppose its government welcomed the JCPOA as a step forward. The National Iranian American Council Iranian American Bar Association and other Iranian American organizations welcomed the JCPOA. The NIAC released a statement saying, our negotiators have done their job to win a strong nuclear deal that prevents an Iranian nuclear weapon, all the while avoiding a catastrophic war. Now is the time for Congress to do theirs. Make no mistake, if Congress rejects this good deal with Iran, there will be no better deal forthcoming and Congress will be left owning an unnecessary war. NIAC created a new group NIAC Action to run advertisements supporting the agreement. NIAC also organized an open letter from 73 Middle East and foreign affairs scholars stating, reactivating diplomatic channels between the United States and Iran is a necessary first step to reduce conflict in the region and that while the nuclear deal will not automatically or immediately bring stability to the region, ultimately a Middle East, 
where diplomacy is the norm rather than the exception will enhance U.S. national security. And interest signatories to the letter include John Esposito S. and Yashata Noam Chomsky, Peter Binet, John Mearsheimer and Stephen Walt. U.S. pro-Israel groups divided on the JCPOA. The American-Israel Public Affairs Committee opposes the agreement and formed a new 501 group, Citizens for a Nuclear-Free Iran, to run a television advertising campaign against the JCPOA. In August 2015 it was reported that AIPAC and Citizens for a Nuclear-Free Iran plan to spend between $20 million and $40 million on its campaign. From mid-July to 4 August 2015, AIPAC Citizens for a Nuclear-Free Iran spent more than $11 million running network television political advertisements opposing the agreement in 23 states spending more than $1 million in the large states of California, Florida, New York, and Texas. In the first week of August, AIPAC said that it had 400 meetings with congressional offices as part of its campaign to defeat the agreement. In contrast to AIPAC, another pro-Israel organization J Street supports the agreement and plans a $5 million advertising effort of its own to encourage Congress to support the agreement. During the first week of August, Jason launched a $2 million three-week ad campaign in support of the agreement with television ads running in Colorado, Maryland, Michigan, Oregon, and Pennsylvania. From mid-July through early August, J Street reported having 125 meetings with congressional officers. J Street has also paid to fly prominent Israelis who support the agreement to the United States to help persuade members of Congress to support the agreement. The group United Against Nuclear Iran opposes the agreement and committed to spending more then $20 million on a national TV, radio, print and digital campaign against the agreement. After UANI announced its opposition, the group's president and co-founder, non-proliferation expert Gary Samor announced that he had concluded that the accord was in the United States' interest and supported the agreement. Samor thus stepped down as president and was replaced by ex-Senator Joseph I. Lieberman. By 20 August UANI had released its third national television ad against the agreement. Various other groups that have also run ad campaigns for or against the agreement. John R. Bolton's Foundation for American Security and Freedom has run advertisements against the agreement, as has Veterans Against the Deal, a group which does not disclose its donors. Various pro-agreement ads were run by MoveOn.org, Americans United for Change and Global Zero, the New York-based Iran Project, a non-profit led by former high-level U.S. diplomats and funded by the Rockefeller Brothers Fund along with the United Nations Association of the United States, supports the agreement. The Rockefeller Fund has also supported the San Francisco-based Plowshares Fund which has spent several years marshalling support for an agreement. On 17 July 2015, a bipartisan open letter endorsing the Iran agreement was signed by more than 100 former U.S. ambassadors and high-ranking State Department officials. The ex-ambassadors wrote, if properly implemented this comprehensive and rigorously negotiated agreement can be an effective instrument in arresting Iran's nuclear program and preventing the spread of nuclear weapons in the volatile and vitally important region of the Middle East. In our judgment the plan deserves congressional support and the opportunity to show it can work. We firmly believe that the most effective way to protect U.S. national security and that of our allies and friends is to ensure that tough-minded diplomacy has a chance to succeed before considering other more costly and risky alternatives. Among the signatories, 
to the letter were Daniel C. Kurtzer, James R. Jones, Frank E. Loy, Princeton N. Lyman, Jack F. Matlock Jr., Donald F. McHenry, Thomas E. McNamara, and Thomas R. Pickering. A separate public letter to Congress in support of the agreement from five former U.S. Ambassadors to Israel from administrations of both parties, and three former Under Secretaries of State was released on the 26th of July 2015. This letter was signed by R. Nicholas Burns, James B. Cunningham, William C. Harrop, Daniel Kurtzer, Thomas R. Pickering, Edward S. Walker Jr., and Frank G. Wisner. The former officials wrote, We are persuaded that this agreement will put in place a set of constraints and monitoring measures that will arrest Iran's nuclear program for at least 15 years and assure that this agreement will leave Iran no legitimate avenue to produce a nuclear weapon during the next 10 to 15 years. This landmark agreement removes the threat that a nuclear armed Iran would pose to the region and to Israel specifically. Another public letter to Congress urging approval of the agreement was signed by a bipartisan group of more than 60 national security leaders including politicians, retired military officers and diplomats. This letter dated 20 July 2015 stated, We congratulate President Obama and all the negotiators for a landmark agreement unprecedented in its importance for preventing the acquisition of nuclear weapons by Iran. We have followed carefully the negotiations as they have progressed, and conclude that the JCPOA represents the achievement of greater security for us and our partners in the region. Among the Republicans who signed this letter are former Treasury Secretary Paul O'Neill, former U.S. Trade Representative Carla Anderson Hills and former Senator Nancy Landon Kassebaum. Among the Democrats who signed the letter are former Secretary of State Madeleine Albright, former Senate Majority Leaders George J. Mitchell and Tom Daschle, former Senator Carl Levin, and former Defense Secretary William Perry. Also signing were former National Security Advisors Zbigniew of Brzezinski and Brent Scowcroft. Under Secretaries of State are Nicholas Burns and Thomas R. Pickering. U.S. Ambassadors Ryan Crocker and Stuart Eisenstadt. Admiral Eric T. Olson. Under Secretary of Defense for Policy Michelle Flower Noy. And Assistant Secretary for Non-Proliferation Robert Einhorn. On 8 August 2015, 29 prominent U.S. scientists, mostly physicists, published an open letter endorsing the agreement. The letter addressed to President Obama says, We congratulate you and your team on negotiating a technically sound, stringent, and innovative deal that will provide the necessary assurance in the coming decade and more then Iran is not developing nuclear weapons and provides a basis for further initiatives to raise the barriers to nuclear proliferation in the Middle East and around the globe. The letter also states that the agreement will advance the cause of peace and security in the Middle East and can serve as a guide post for future non-proliferation agreements. The 29 signatories included some of the world's most knowledgeable experts in the fields of nuclear weapons and arms control, many of whom have held Q clearances and have been longtime advisors to Congress, the White House, and federal agencies. The five primary authors were Richard L. Garwin, Robert J. Goldston, R. Scott Kemp, Rush D. Holt, and Frank N. von Hippel. Six Nobel Prize in Physics laureates co-signed the letter, Philip W. Anderson of Princeton University, Leon N. Cooper of Brown University, Sheldon L. Glasher of Boston University, David Gross of the University of California Santa Barbara, Burton Richter of Stanford University, and Frank Wilczek of the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Among the other scientists, to sign were Siegfried S. Hecker, Freeman Dyson, and Sidney Drell. On the 11th of August 2015, 
an open letter endorsing the agreement signed by 36 retired military generals and admirals titled The Iran Deal Benefits U.S. National Security, an open letter from retired generals and admirals was released. The letter signed by retired officers from all five branches of the U.S. Armed Services said that the agreement was the most effective means currently available to prevent Iran from obtaining nuclear weapons and said if at some point it becomes necessary to consider military action against Iran gathering sufficient international support for such an effort would only be possible if we have first given the diplomatic path a chance. We must exhaust diplomatic options before moving to military ones. The signers included General James E. Hoss Cartwright of the Marine Corps, former Vice Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, General Joseph P. Hoare of the Marine Corps, the former commander of the U.S. Central Command, and Generals Merrill McPeak and Lloyd W. Newton of the Air Force. Other signers include Lieutenant Generals Robert G. Gard, Jr and Claudia J. Kennedy, Vice Admiral Lee F. Gunn, Rear Admirals Garland Wright and Joseph Shestak, and Major General Paul D. Eaton. The above letter was answered on 25 August 2015 by a letter signed by more than 200 retired generals and admirals opposing the deal. The letter asserted, the agreement does not cut off every pathway for Iran to acquire nuclear weapons. To the contrary, it provides Iran with a legitimate pathway for doing exactly that simply by abiding by the deal. The JCPOA would threaten the national security and vital interests of the United States and therefore should be disapproved by the Congress. This letter was organized by Leon A. Budd. Edney, other sinners included Admiral James A. Lyons. Lieutenant General William G. Boykin, former Under Secretary of Defense for Intelligence, and Lieutenant General Thomas McInerney, former Vice Commander of U.S. Air Forces in Europe. Retired Marine Corps General Anthony Zinni said that he had refused requests from both sides to sign the letters saying to Time magazine, I'm convinced that 90% of the guys who signed the letter one way or the other don't have any clue about whether it's a good or bad deal. They sign it, because somebody's asked them to sign it. As to the JCPOA, Zinni said, the agreement's fine, if you think it can work. But if this is a Neville Chamberlain, then you're in a world of shit. On 13 August, retired Senators Carl Levin of Michigan, a Democrat, and John Warner of Virginia, a Republican co-wrote an op-ed in support of the agreement titled Why Hawks Should Also Back the Iran Deal published in Politico. Levin and Warner, both past chairman of the Senate Armed Services Committee, argued if we reject the agreement, we risk isolating ourselves and damaging our ability to assemble the strongest possible coalition to stop Iran in the event that military action was needed in the future. Levin and Warner wrote, The deal on the table is a strong agreement on many counts, and it leaves in place the robust deterrence and credibility of a military option. We urge our former colleagues not to take any action which would undermine the deterrent value of a coalition that participates in and could support the use of a military option. The failure of the United States to join the agreement would have that effect. On 14 August, retired Senators Richard Luger of Indiana, a Republican, and J. Bennett Johnston of Louisiana, a Democrat, also wrote in support of the agreement. In a column for Reuters, Luger and Johnston argued rejection of the agreement would severely undermine the U.S. role as a leader and reliable partner around the globe. If Washington walks away, from this hard-fought multilateral agreement its dependability would likely be doubted for decades. They also wrote, Tehran would be the winner of this U.S. rejection because it would achieve its major objective, the lifting of most sanctions without being required to accept constraints on its nuclear program. 
Iran could also claim to be a victim of American perfidy and try to convince other nations to break with U.S. leadership and with the entire international sanctions regime. On 17 August 2015 a group of 75 arms control and nuclear non-proliferation experts issued a joint statement endorsing the agreement. The statement says the JCPOA is a strong long-term and verifiable agreement that will be a net plus for international nuclear non-proliferation efforts and that the JCPOA's rigorous limits and transparency measures will make it very likely that any future effort by Iran to pursue nuclear weapons even a clandestine program would be detected promptly, providing the opportunity to intervene decisively to prevent Iran from acquiring a nuclear weapon. The letter was organized through the Nonpartisan Arms Control Association. Among the 75 signatories are the Valerie Plame and Joseph C. Wilson, former IAEA Director General Hans Blix, Morton H. Halperin, and experts from the Brookings Institution Stimson Center and other think tanks. On 3 September an open letter to President Obama signed by 56 people was issued criticizing the JCPOA as unverifiable. The letter said, guided by our experience with U.S. and foreign nuclear weapons programs as well as with the history and practice of arms control, non-proliferation and intelligence matters we judge the current JCPOA to be a very bad deal indeed. Signers included Boykin, Bolton, ex-CIA Director James Walsey, former National Security Adviser Robert McFarlane, Paula A. D. Sutter, former Assistant Secretary of State for Verification Compliance and Implementation, various former ACDA officials, and former Sandia National Laboratories President, Director C. Paul Robinson. Foreign diplomats are also involved in the congressional debate. The Israeli ambassador to the United States Ron Derma appeared on cable television shows to attack the agreement while ambassadors from European nations including Sir Peter Westmacott. The British ambassador to the United States came on to say the precise opposite. Derma also lobbied members of Congress on Capitol Hill against the agreement while diplomats from France, Britain and Germany made the rounds on Capitol Hill to advocate for the agreement. On 4 August, P51 diplomats held a rare meeting of world powers envoys on Capitol Hill, with about 30 Senate Democrats to urge support for the agreement, saying, if Congress rejects this good deal and the U.S. is forced to walk away, Iran will be left with an unconstrained nuclear program with far weaker monitoring arrangements. The current international consensus on sanctions would unravel an international unity, and pressure on Iran would be seriously undermined. On Meet the Press on 6 September 2014, former Secretary of State Colin Powell expressed support for the nuclear agreement with Iran, saying that it was a pretty good deal. Powell said that various provisions accepted by Iran such as the reduction in centrifuges and the uranium stockpile and the agreement to shut down its plutonium reactor were remarkable changes that stopped the Iranian pathway to a nuclear weapons program. Powell also defended the verification provisions of the agreement saying, I think a very vigorous verification regime has been put into place. Former Ambassador Dennis Ross, a longtime American negotiator in the Middle East, wrote that he was not yet convinced by either proponents or opponents of the agreement. Ross wrote that the United States should be focused on deterring the Iranians from cheating. After year 15 of the agreement, Ross wrote, President Obama emphasizes that the agreement is based on verification, not trust. But our catching Iran cheating is less important than the price they know they will pay if we catch them. Deterrence needs to apply not just for the life of the deal, 
As part of a deterrence strategy Roth proposed transferring to Israel the U.S. massive ordnance penetrator bunker buster bomb at some point before year 15 of the agreement. In a 25 August op-ed in the Washington Post, Roth and David H. Petraeus again argued for transferring the mop to Israel. The Jewish American community was divided on the agreement. On 19 August 2015, leaders of the Reform Jewish Movement, the largest Jewish denomination in the United States, issued a lengthy public statement expressed a neutral position on the agreement. The statement, signed by the leaders of the Union for Reform Judaism Central Conference of American Rabbis, Religious Action Center of Reform Judaism and Association of Reform Zionists of America, reflected what Rabbi Rick Jacobs, president of the URJ, called deep divisions within the movement. On 20 August 2015 a group of 26 prominent current and foreign American Jewish communal leaders published a full page out in the New York Times, with a statement backing the agreement. Signers included three former chairs of the Conference of Presidents of Major American Jewish Organizations as well as former AIPAC Executive Director Tom Dine. Separately, a group of 340 rabbis organized by Amin who issued a public letter to Congress on 17 August 2015 in support of the agreement saying, we along with many other Jewish leaders fully support this historic nuclear accord. The signers were mostly reform rabbis but included at least 50 rabbis from the conservative movement and at least one orthodox rabbi. Prominent rabbis who signed this letter included Sharon Brew Burton Vizhetsky Nina Beth Cardan, Lawrence Kushner Sharon Klein Bauman Amy Elberg. In a separate letter released 27 August, 11 Democratic Jewish former members of Congress urged support for the agreement. The letter noted the signatories' pro-Israel credentials and said that the agreement halts the immediate threat of a nuclear-armed Iran while a rejection of the deal would put Iran back on the path to develop a nuclear weapon within two to three months. Signatories included former Senator Carl Levin and former representatives Barney Frank Mel Levine, Steve Rothman and Robert Wexler. Conversely, a group of 900 rabbis signed an open letter written by Kalman Top and Yona Buchstein in late August calling upon Congress to reject the agreement. The Orthodox Union and American Jewish Committee also announced opposition to the agreement. The Roman Catholic Church has expressed support for the agreement. In a 14 July 2015 letter, to Congress, Bishop Oscar Cantu, Chairman of the Committee on International Justice and Peace of the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops, stated that the JCPOA was a momentous agreement which signals progress in global nuclear non-proliferation. Cantu wrote that Catholic bishops in the United States will continue to urge Congress to endorse the result of these intense negotiations because the alternative leads toward armed conflict an outcome of profound concern to the Church. On 25 August 2015 a group of 53 Christian faith leaders from a variety of denominations sent a message to Congress urging them to support the agreement. The Christian leaders wrote, This is a moment to remember the wisdom of Jesus who proclaimed from the Sermon on the Mount, blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called children of God. There is no question we are all better off with this deal than without it. The letter was coordinated by a Quaker group, the Friends Committee on National Legislation. Signatories to the letter included Jim Wallace of Sojourners, John C. Dorhauer, General Minister and President of the United Church of Christ. Shane Claiborne, Adam Essel of Evangelicals for Middle East Understanding, Archbishop Vikan Akarzian of the Armenian Orthodox Church, A. Roy Medley, the head of American Baptist Churches USA, 
the Rev. Paula Clayton Dempsey of the Alliance of Baptists Senior Pastor Joel C. Hunter of Northland A Church Distributed, and Sister Simone Campbell, a leader of the Catholic Nuns on the Bus Campaigns. Congressional Committee Hearings A hearing on the JCPOA before the Senate Foreign Relations Committee took place on 23 July 2015. Secretary of State Kerry Treasury Secretary Jack Lew and Energy Secretary Moniz testified. Republican Senator Bob Corker of Tennessee, the committee chairman, said in his opening statement that where the talks began the goal was to dismantle the Iranian nuclear program whereas the achieved agreement codified the industrialization of their nuclear program. Corker addressing Secretary of State Kerry said, I believe you've been fleeced and what you've really done here is you have turned Iran from being a pariah to now, Congress Congress being a pariah. Corker asserted that a new threshold in U.S. foreign policy was crossed and the agreement would enable a state sponsor of terror to obtain sophisticated industrial nuclear development program that has as we know only one real practical need. The committee's ranking Democratic member Senator Benjamin Cardan of Maryland said he had many questions and his hope was that the answers will cause a debate in Congress and the American people. Democrats led by Senator Barbara Boxer of California expressed support for the agreement with Boxer saying that criticisms by Republicans were ridiculous, unfair and wrong. Corker and Cardan sent a letter to Obama saying the bilateral IAEA Iran document should be available for Congress to review. At the hearing Kerry Liu and Moniz were unequivocal in their were statements that the accord was the best that could be achieved, and that without it the international sanctions regime would collapse. Kerry warned that if the United States would be on our own if it were to walk away, from a multilateral agreement alongside the five global powers. Kerry stated that the belief that some sort of unicorn arrangement involving Iran's complete capitulation could be achieved was a fantasy plain and simple. The Washington Post reported, Moniz emerged as the calm center of the proceedings beginning his interjections with recitations of what he described as facts and mildly observing that Republican characterizations were incorrect, Kerry Liu and Moniz faced uniform animus of Republicans at the hearing with Republican senators giving long and often scathing speeches denouncing what they described as a fatally flawed agreement and accusing the administration of dangerous naivete and showing little interest in responses from the three cabinet secretaries. The Washington Post reported on 12 issues related to the agreement over which the two sides disagreed at the hearing. On 28 July Kerry Moniz and Lou testified before the House Committee on Foreign Affairs. Committee Chairman Ed Royce, Republican of California said in his opening statement we are being asked to consider an agreement that gives Iran permanent sanctions relief for temporary nuclear restrictions. Royce also said the inspection regime came up short from anywhere, anytime, access to Iran's nuclear facilities, and criticized the removal of restrictions on Iran's ballistic missile program and conventional arms. The committee's ranking member Rep. Elliot Engel, Democrat of New York, said he has serious questions and concerns about the agreement. Kerry Liu and Moniz spent four hours testifying before the committee. At the hearing, Kerry stated that if Congress killed the deal you'll not only be giving Iran a free pass to double the pace of its uranium enrichment to build a heavy water reactor to install new and more efficient centrifuges but they will do it all without the unprecedented inspection and transparency measures that we have secured. Everything that we have tried to prevent will now happen. On 29 July Secretary of Defense Ashton Carter, General Martin Dempsey the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff Kerry Moniz, 
and Liu appeared before the Senate Armed Services Committee in a three-hour hearing. Carter and Dempsey had been invited to testify by Republican Senator John McCain of Arizona. The chairman of the committee, Kerry Monners and Liu attended the hearing at the invitation of the Pentagon. In his opening statement, McCain said that if this agreement failed and U.S. armed forces were called to take action against Iran they could be at greater risk because of this agreement. He also asserted that the agreement may lead American allies and partners to fateful decisions and result in growing regional security competition, new arms races, nuclear proliferation, and possibly conflict. The committee's ranking Democratic member Senator Jack Reed of Rhode Island said Congress had an obligation to independently validate that the agreement will meet our common goal of stopping Iran from acquiring a nuclear weapon and stated the agreement no matter your position on it is historic and if implemented scrupulously could serve as a strategic inflection point in the world's relations with Iran for international non-proliferation efforts and for the political and security dynamics in the Middle East. Carter said the agreement prevented Iran from getting a nuclear weapon in a comprehensive and verifiable way. He assured the committee that the deal would not limit the U.S. ability to respond with military force if needed. In response to a question from McCain, Carter said he had no reason to foresee that the agreement would cause Iran's threatening behavior to change more broadly, stating that is why it's important that Iran not have a nuclear weapon. Dempsey offered what he described as a pragmatic view. He neither praised nor criticized the deal, but did testify that the agreement reduced the chances of a near-term military conflict between the United States and Iran. Dempsey said that the agreement works to keep Iran from developing nuclear weapons, but does not address other concerns about Iran's malign activities in the region ranging from ballistic missile technology to weapons trafficking to malicious activity in cyberspace. Dempsey testified ultimately time and Iranian behavior will determine if the nuclear agreement is effective and sustainable, and stated that he would continue to provide military options to the president. Senator Joni Ernst expressed disagreement with President Obama who stated that the choice was the Iran nuclear deal or war, when General Martin Dempsey testified that the United States had a range of options and he presented them to the President Ernst said, it's imperative everybody on the panel understand that there are other options available. Under the JCPOA, Iran must submit a full report on its nuclear history before it can receive any sanctions relief. The IAEA has confidential technical arrangements with many countries as a matter of standard operating procedure. Republican lawmakers refer to these agreements as secret side deals, and claim that the JCPOA hinges on a set of agreements no one in the administration has actually seen. Senator Tom Cotton of Arkansas, a Republican opponent of the agreement, said that Kerry had acted like Pontius Pilate and washed his hands kicked it to the IAEA knowing Congress would not get this information unless someone went out to find it. On July 30, Republican Senator Ted Cruz of Texas introduced a resolution seeking a delay in the review period, arguing the 60-calendar-day period for review of such agreement in the Senate cannot be considered to have begun until the majority leader certifies that all of the materials required to be transmitted under the definition of the term agreement under such act, including any side agreement with Iran and United States government-issued guidance materials in relation to Iran have been transmitted to the majority leader. On 5 August, Yuki Romano, Director General of the IAEA, spoke with members of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee in a closed briefing about two IAEA documents, an agreement on inspection protocols with Iran and an agreement 
with Iran regarding Iranian disclosure of its previous nuclear activity. Following this briefing, with Amano Republican Senator Bob Corker the committee chairman told reporters, the majority of members here left with far more questions than they had before the meeting took place and we cannot get to him to even confirm that we will have physical access inside of Parchin. The committee's ranking Democratic member Senator Benjamin Cardin told reporters, I thought today was helpful but it was not a substitute for seeing the document. State Department spokesman John Kirby responded there's no secret deals between Iran and the IAEA that the P-51 has not been briefed on in detail and stated these kinds of technical arrangements with the IAEA are a matter of standard practice that are not released publicly are to other states but our experts are familiar and comfortable with the content which we would be happy to discuss with Congress in a classified setting. The Center for Arms Control and Non-Proliferation writes that the arrangement specifies procedural information regarding how the IAEA will conduct its investigation into Iran's past nuclear history, including mentioning the names of informants who will be interviewed. Releasing this information would place those informants and the information they hold at risk. Mark Hibbs of the Nuclear Policy Program at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace and Thomas Shea, a former IAEA safeguards official and former head of defense nuclear non-proliferation programs at the Pacific Northwest National Laboratory wrote that the charges of a secret side deal made by opponents of the agreement were a manufactured controversy. Hibbs and Shane noted, The IAEA has safeguards agreement with 180 countries. All have similar information protection provisions. Without these, governments would not open the nuclear programs for multilateral oversight. So IAEA Director General Yukio Imano was acting by the book on August 5 when he told members of Congress that he couldn't share with them the details of the verification protocol the IAEA had negotiated with Iran as part of a bilateral roadmap. David Albright, founder and president of the Institute for Science and International Security and former IAEA nuclear inspector stated that the demands for greater transparency regarding the agreement between Iran and IAEA aren't unreasonable and Iran is a big screamer for more confidentiality. Nonetheless if the IAEA wanted to make it more open it could. Albright also proposed that the United States should clearly and publicly confirm and Congress should support with legislation that if Iran does not address the IAEA's concerns about the past military dimensions of its nuclear programs, U.S. sanctions will not be lifted. Congressional Support and Opposition Republican leaders vowed to attempt to kill the agreement as soon as it was released, even before classified sections were made available to Congress and Republican lawmakers raced to send out news releases criticizing it. According to the Washington Post, most congressional Republicans remain deeply skeptical some openly scornful of the prospect of relieving economic sanctions while leaving any Iranian uranium enrichment capability intact. Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell, Republican of Kentucky, said the deal appears to fall well short of the goal we all thought was trying to be achieved, which was that Iran would not be a nuclear state. A New York Times news analysis stated that Republican opposition to the agreement seems born of genuine distaste for the deal's details inherent distrust of President Obama and hence loyalty to Israel, and an expansive view of the role that sanctions have played beyond preventing Iran's nuclear abilities. The Washington Post identified 12 issues related to the agreement on which the two sides disagreed including the efficacy of inspections 
At undeclared sites, the effectiveness of the snapback sanctions, the significance of limits on enrichment, the significance of IAEA side agreements, the effectiveness of inspections of military sites, the consequences of walking away from an agreement, and the effects of lifting sanctions. One area of disagreement between supporters and opponents of the JCPOA is the consequences of walking away from an agreement, and whether renegotiation of the agreement is a realistic option. Senator Chuck Schumer, Democrat of New York and opponent of the agreement called for the U.S. government to keep sanctions in place, strengthen the MAND, pursue the hard-trodden path of diplomacy once more difficult as it may be. Senator Bob Corker, Republican of Tennessee, said that he believed that it was hyperbole to say that the agreement was the only alternative to war. President Obama, by contrast, argued that renegotiation of the deal is unrealistic, stating in his American University speech, the notion that there is a better deal to be had relies on vague promises of toughness, and stated those making this argument are either ignorant of Iranian society, or they are not being straight with the American people. Neither the Iranian government, or the Iranian opposition or the Iranian people would agree to what they would view as a total surrender of their sovereignty. Obama also argued, those who say we can just walk away from this deal and maintain sanctions are selling a fantasy. Instead of strengthening our position as some have suggested, Congress rejection would almost certainly result in multilateral sanctions unraveling because our closest allies in Europe or in Asia, much less China or Russia, certainly are not going to enforce existing sanctions for another 5, 10, 15 years according to the dictates of the U.S. Congress because their willingness to support sanctions in the first place was based on Iran ending its pursuit of nuclear weapons. It was not based on the belief that Iran cannot have peaceful nuclear power. Secretary of State Kerry has echoed these remarks saying in July 2015 that the idea of a better deal, some sort of unicorn arrangement involving Iran's complete capitulation, is a fantasy plain and simple and our intelligence community will tell you that. Senator Al Franken, Democrat of Minnesota, a supporter of the agreement, wrote, Some say that should the Senate reject this agreement we would be in position to negotiate a better one. But I've spoken to representatives of the five nations that helped broker the deal, and they agree that this simply wouldn't be the case. On 28 July 2015 Representative Sander M. Levin, Democrat of Michigan, the longest-serving Jewish member now in Congress, announced in a lengthy statement that he would support the JCPOA, saying, The agreement is the best way to stop Iran from obtaining a nuclear weapon, and that a rejection of the agreement would lead the international sanctions regime to quickly fall apart as sanctions likely would not be continued even by our closest allies and the United States would be isolated trying to enforce our unilateral sanctions as to Iran's banking and oil sectors. A key figure in the congressional review process is Senator Benjamin Cardan of Maryland, a Democrat who is the ranking member of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. Cardan took a phone call from Israeli Prime Minister Netanyahu opposing the agreement and participated in a private 90-minute session with Energy Secretary Monash supporting the agreement. On 21 July, Cardan said that if the agreement is implemented the United States should increase military aid to Israel and friendly Gulf states. On 4 August 2015 three key and closely watched Senate Democrats Tim Kaine of Virginia Barbara Boxer of California and Bill Nelson of Florida announced their support for the agreement in a floor speech that day. Kane said that the agreement is far preferable to any other alternative including war and America has honored its best traditions. 
and shown that patient diplomacy can achieve what isolation and hostility cannot. In a similar floor speech the same day Nelson said that, I am convinced that the agreement will stop Iran from developing a nuclear weapon for at least the next 10 to 15 years. No other available alternative accomplishes this vital objective and if the U.S. walks away from this multinational agreement I believe we would find ourselves alone in the world with little credibility. Conversely another closely watched Senator Chuck Schumer of New York, who is expected to make a bid to become Senate Democratic leader announced his opposition to the agreement on 6 August writing. There is a strong case that we are better off without an agreement than with one according to an Associated Press report. The classified assessment of the United States intelligence community on the agreement concludes that because Iran will be required by the agreement to provide international inspectors with unprecedented volume of information about nearly every aspect of its existing nuclear program. Iran's ability to conceal a covert weapons program will be diminished. In a 13 August letter to colleagues 10 current and former Democratic members of the House Select Committee on Intelligence referred to this assessment as a reason to support the agreement, writing, We are confident that this monitoring and the highly intrusive inspections provided for in the agreement along with our own intelligence capabilities make it nearly impossible for Iran to develop a covert enrichment effort without detection. The ten members also wrote, You need not take our word for it and referred members to the classified assessment itself, which is located in an office in the Capitol basement and is available for members of Congress to read. Congressional Votes a resolution of disapproval was initially expected to pass both the House and Senate meaning. The real challenge for the White House is whether they can marshal enough Democrats to sustain the veto. Two-thirds of both houses are required to override a veto, meaning that one-third of either House could sustain President Obama's veto of a resolution of disapproval. By early September 2015 34 senators had publicly confirmed support for the deal, a crucial threshold, because it ensured that the Senate could sustain any veto of a resolution of disapproval. Senator Barbara Mikulski of Maryland announced support on 2 September, a day after Chris Coons of Delaware and Bob Casey Jr. of Pennsylvania also announced support reaching 34 votes, and assuring that an eventual disapproval resolution passed in the Senate could not override an Obama veto. By the following day 38 Democratic senators supported the deal, three were opposed, and five were still undecided. By 8 September all senators had made a commitment on the agreement, with 42 in support and 58 opposed. It is possible for senators in support of the agreement to kill the disapproval resolution outright in the Senate by effectively filibustering it, making it unnecessary for Obama to veto a disapproval resolution at all. However, this is only possible if at least 41 vote to do so, and several senators in support of the agreement including Coons have suggested they'd prefer an up or down vote on the deal instead of blocking it altogether. The apparent success of a strategy to marshal congressional support for the deal linked to a carefully orchestrated rollout of endorsements was attributed to lessons learned by the White House and congressional Democrats during struggles in previous summers with Republicans in particular over Obama's health care legislation. An August 2015 meeting, at which top diplomats from the UK, Russia, China, Germany, and France told ten undecided Democratic senators they had no intention of returning to the negotiating table was reported to be particularly crucial. Senator Kuhn said, They were clear and strong that we will not join you in reimposing sanctions 
On 20 August 2015 House Minority Leader Nancy Pelosi said that House Democrats had the votes to uphold a veto of a resolution of disapproval. To sustain a veto Pelosi would need to hold only 146 of the 188 House Democrats by 20 August. About 60 House Democrats have publicly declared their support for the final agreement and about 12 had publicly declared their opposition. In May 2015, before the final agreement was announced, 151 House Democrats signed in support for the broad outlines in the April Framework Agreement. None of those signatories have announced opposition to the final agreement. It was originally expected that the House would vote on a formal resolution of disapproval, Introduced by Rep. Ed Royce, Republican of California, the chair of the House Foreign Affairs Committee. As the Senate moved toward a vote on a resolution of disapproval, House leadership planned to vote on a similar resolution of disapproval. However, conservative Republicans revolted in protest as the chamber's right flank wanted tougher action from its leader and the House Republican leadership plan to vote instead chose to bring a resolution of approval to the floor as a way to effectively force Democrats who had voiced support for the president to formally register such endorsement. On the 11th of September 2015 the resolution failed as expected on a 162,269 vote. 244 Republicans and 25 Democrats voted no while 162 Democrats and no Republicans voted yes. On the same day House Republicans held two additional votes, one on a resolution claiming that the Obama administration had failed to meet the requirements of a congressional review period on the deal and another resolution which would prevent the United States from lifting any sanctions. The former resolution passed on a party-line vote with all Republicans in favor, and all Democrats opposed the latter resolution passed on nearly a party-line vote, with all Republicans and two Democrats in favor and every other Democrat opposed. The House action against the resolution was a symbolic vote that will have no consequence for the implementation of the deal and the two anti-agreement measures passed by the House were seen as unlikely to even reach Obama's desk. On 10 September, the day before the vote House Speaker Boehner threatened to use every tool at our disposal to stop slow and delay this agreement from being fully implemented and said that a lawsuit by House Republicans against the President was an option that is very possible. Four months later however House Republicans abandoned their plans for a lawsuit against the administration over the JCPOA. Conservative legal activist Larry Clayman filed a lawsuit against President Obama and members of Congress in July 2015 in federal court in West Palm Beach, Florida asserting that the agreement should be considered a treaty requiring Senate ratification. Clayman's suit was dismissed for lack of standing in September 2015. Review period in Iran Iranian Supreme Leader Khamenei issued a letter of guidelines to President Rouhani, ordering him on how to proceed with the deal. On 21 June 2015 the Iranian parliament decided to form a committee to study the JCPOA and to wait at least 80 days before voting on it. Foreign Minister Mohammad Javad Zarif, an Atomic Energy Organization of Iran chief Ali Akbar Salari, defended the deal in parliament on the same day. Although the Iranian constitution gives parliament the right to cancel the deal, it was reported that this outcome is unlikely. The New York Times reported, the legislators have effectively opted to withhold their judgment until they know whether the American Congress approves of the deal. In televised remarks made on 23 July 2015, 
Iranian President Hassan Rouhani rejected domestic criticism of the JCPOA from Iranian hardliners, such as the Islamic Revolutionary Guards Corps and its allies which have criticized the accord as an invasive affront to the country's sovereignty and a capitulation to foreign adversaries, particularly the United States. In remarks described by the New York Times as blunt and uncharacteristically frank, Rouhani claimed a popular mandate to make an agreement based on his election in 2013 and warned that the alternative was an economic stone age brought on by sanctions which have shriveled oil exports and denied the country access to the global banking system. On 26 July, a two-page top-secret directive sent to Iranian newspaper editors from Iran's Supreme National Security Council surfaced online. In the document, newspapers are instructed to avoid criticism of the agreement and to avoid giving the impression of a rift at the highest levels of government. The BBC reported that the document appears to be aimed at constraining criticism of the JCPOA by Iranian hardliners. On 3 September, Iranian Supreme Leader Khamenei said that the Majlis should make the final decision on the agreement. On the same day Ali Larajani, the Speaker of the Parliament, said that he support the agreement and that the agreement needs to be discussed and needs to be approved by the Iranian parliament. There will be heated discussions and debates. Abbas Malani and Michael McFaul write that those in Iran supporting the deal include moderates inside the government. Many opposition leaders are majority of Iranian citizens and many in the Iranian-American diaspora a disparate group that has rarely agreed on anything. Until now, within the government Rouhani and Foreign Minister Javad Zarif, who negotiated the agreement are now the most vocal in defending it against Iranian hawks. Also vocally supporting the agreement are former President Akbar Hashemi Rafsanjani and Mohammad Khatami and moderates within parliament. The agreement is also supported by most prominent opposition leaders including Mir Hossein Mousavi, a 2009 presidential candidate who is under house arrest for his role as a leader of the Green Movement. Conversely the most militantly authoritarian, conservative and anti-Western leaders and groups within Iran oppose the deal. The anti-agreement coalition in Iran includes former President Mahmoud Ahmadinejad, former head of Atomic Energy Organization of Iran Faridun Abbasi, ex-nuclear negotiator Saeed Jalili, and various conservative clerics and revolutionary guard commanders. This group has issued blistering attacks on the incompetence of Iran's negotiating team claiming that negotiators caved on many key issues and were outmaneuvered by more clever and sinister American diplomats. Iranian Defense Minister Hossein Deccan said on 2 September that Iran would not allow the IAEA to visit every site or facility that it wishes. The Majlis Special Commission for examining the JCPOA has invited Ali Shamkhani as well as members of former nuclear negotiation team including Ali Bagheri and Faridun Abbasi, to comment on the deal. During the session Saeed Jalili ex-chief negotiator has slammed the deal, stating approximately 100 absolute rights of Iran were conceded to the opposing side. He believes the deal is unacceptable because Iran makes an exceptional nuclear case replacing permission with right under the NPT and accepting unconventional measures. He also believes that the deal has crossed the red lines drawn by the supreme leader of Iran. His testimony was criticized by commission members Masoud Peshkian and Abbas Ali Mansouri Irani. In another session current negotiator as Abbas Arakchi and Majid Takhtravanchi defended the deal, led by Javad Zarif. In the Iranian media the leading reformist newspapers Etamad and Shag continue to write approvingly of the negotiations and their outcome.
Conversely, the leading conservative paper et al. has criticized the agreement. The most bombastic and hardline criticism of the deal has come from Kahan, which is edited by Hossein Shariat Madari and closely associated with Khamenei, the supreme leader. The agreement is supported by many Iranian dissidents, including Nobel Peace Prize laureate human rights activist and Iranian exile Shirin Ebadi, who labeled as extremists those who oppose the agreement in Iran and America. Likewise, dissident journalist and former political prisoner Akbar Ganji expressed hope. Step-by-step -step nuclear accords the lifting of economic sanctions and the improvement of the relations between Iran and Western powers will gradually remove the warlike and securitized environment from Iran. Citing Iran's human rights situation and the lack of religious and political freedom in the country some dissidents oppose the agreement including Ahmad Batebi, Nazanin Afshan Jaman Ruz Bey Farahani Poor who signed an open letter arguing more pressure should be applied to the regime not less. On 13 October the New York Times and many other major U.S. news sources reported that the Iranian parliament had approved the JPCOA by a vote of 161 votes in favor 59 against and 13 abstentions. Major Iranian news sources including Fars News Agency and Press TV referred to as a semi-official government source by U.S. media, reported that what was actually approved was a document consisting of the text of the JPCOA, supplemented by text unilaterally added by Iran and not agreed by the P-51. Implementation Day after the IAEA confirmed that Iran met the relevant requirements under the JCPOA, all nuclear sanctions were lifted by the UN, the EU and the United States on 16 January 2016. Washington imposed new sanctions on 11 companies and individuals for supplying Iran's ballistic missile program on the first day of the implementation. According to carry $1.7 billion in debt with interest is to be paid to Tehran. However, some Iranian financial institutions including Ansar Bank, Bank Sadarat, Bank Sadarat PLC, and Mayer Bank remain on the SDN list in a number of U.S. sanctions with respect to Iran including existing terrorism human rights and ballistic missiles related sanctions will remain in place deterring Iran from obtaining nuclear weapons. Some argue that deterrence is the key to ensuring not just that Iran is in compliance with the agreement but also to preventing them from developing nuclear weapons. Former Assistant Secretary for Non-Proliferation Robert Einhorn, a supporter of the agreement, wrote it would be better to have permanent and longer-term restrictions on Iran's enrichment program but preventing a nuclear-armed Iran is possible provided the United States and key partners maintain a strong and credible deterrent against a future Iranian decision to go for the bomb. According to Michael Eisenstadt, director of the Military and Security Studies program at the Washington Institute for Near East Policy Deterring Iran, from developing or acquiring nuclear weapons will remain the core imperative driving U.S. policy in the coming years. Four days after the JCPOA was adopted, Khamenei delivered a speech highlighting his fatwa and rejecting the claim that the nuclear talks rather than Iran's religious abstinence prevented Iran from acquiring nuclear weapons. He said, in a letter addressed to Rep. Gerald Nadler, Democrat of New York, President Barack Obama raised the issue about U.S. ability to deter Iran from obtaining nuclear weapons. Ambassador Dennis Ross, former top Mideast official, and General David Petraeus, former CIA director, wrote in a Washington Post op-ed, Bolstering deterrence is essential in addressing key vulnerabilities of the agreement. Petraeus, 
and Ross asserted that if Iran decide to race toward a nuclear weapon there is a need not to speak of our options but of our readiness to use force, since the threat of force is far more likely to deter the Iranians. They said the president could resolve their concerns by stating that he would use military force to prevent Iran from obtaining a nuclear weapon including producing highly enriched uranium. Even after the deal ends in 15 years, it is critically important for the president to state this clearly particularly given his perceived hesitancy to use force they said. In the same letter Obama detailed the possible non-military unilateral and multilateral responses to be employed should Iran violate the agreement however the president made it clear, ultimately, it is essential that we retain the flexibility to decide what responsive measures we and our allies deem appropriate for any non-compliance. Flexibility meant that Obama rejected specifying the penalties for smaller violations of the accord in advance. The open letter which was signed by more than 100 former U.S. ambassadors and high-ranking State Department officials endorsing the agreement begins with the words, The Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action with Iran stands as a landmark agreement in deterring the proliferation of nuclear weapons. In contrast Michael Mandelbaum the Christian A. Herter professor at the Johns Hopkins University School of Advanced International Studies wrote that nuclear non-proliferation in the Middle East ultimately depended not on the details of the Vienna Agreement but on the familiar Cold War policy of deterrence. Mandelbaum added that if President Obama will leave office without Iran building the bomb, the responsibility for conducting a policy of effective deterrence will fall on his successor. Harvard Law professor Alan Dershowitz expressed his view on deterring Iran from pursuing nuclear weapons as follows, Nothing currently on the table will deter Iran. Sanctions are paper protests to an oil-rich nation. Diplomacy has already failed because Russia and China are playing both sides. Economic With the prospective lifting of some sanctions the agreement is expected to have a significant impact on both the economy of Iran and global markets. The energy sector is particularly important, with Iran having nearly 10% of global oil reserves and 18% of natural gas reserves. Millions of barrels of Iranian oil may come onto global markets lowering the price of crude oil. However the impact will not be immediate because Iran will not be able to implement measures that are needed to lift sanctions until the end of 2015. Technology and investment from global integrated oil companies are expected to increase capacity from Iran's oil fields and refineries which have been in disarray in recent years plagued by mismanagement and underinvestment. Senior executives from oil giants Royal Dutch Shell, Total SA and ENI met with the Iranian oil minister in Vienna in June, the month before the JCPOA was announced and have been seeking business opportunities in Iran. The economic impact of a partial lifting of sanctions extends beyond the energy sector. The New York Times reported consumer-oriented companies in particular could find opportunity in this country with 81 million consumers many of whom are young and prefer Western products. Iran is considered a strong emerging market play by investment and trading firms. French auto manufacturer PSA Peugeot Citroën has emerged as one of the first Western companies to re-establish commercial ties following the deal. In February 2016, after the end of a four-year restriction Iranian banks except Meransa and Sadarat banks reconnected to the SWIFT. However, many Iranian observers including critics of Rouhani's administration economists and private sector representatives claimed the news was false. According to Financial Times report Iran's banks are indeed being reconnected to SWIFT but there have been 
Too few transactions because European and US banks are worried about the risks of dealing with them and scarred by a string of multi-billion dollar fines. Three months after implementation Iran has been unable to tap about $100 billion held abroad. On 15 April 2016 Central Bank of Iran Governor Vali Olasif said in an interview with Bloomberg Television that Iran has gotten almost nothing from the accord. He also met Secretary of Treasury Jack Liu on the sidelines of his Washington trip to discuss the concerns. Josh Ernest, the White House press secretary, said that the agreement that's included in the JCPOA does not include giving Iran access to the U.S. financial system or to allow the execution of so-called U-turn transactions. On 20 April 2016, the Supreme Court of the United States decided on Bank Markazi v. Peterson, and ruled that almost $2 billion of Iranian frozen assets must be given to families of people killed in the 1983 Beirut barracks bombings. The court accused Iran of being responsible for the incident. Iranian Foreign Minister Zarif called the ruling highway robbery lashing the court for its previous ruling of holding Iran responsible for 9-11 adding that the Supreme Court is the Supreme Court of the United States, not the Supreme Court of the world. We're not under its jurisdiction nor is our money. On 27 November 2016 Schlumberger, the largest oil service company in the world, announced that it had signed a preliminary deal to study an Iranian oil field. According to Schlumberger's spokesperson, this was a memorandum of understanding with a state-run national Iranian oil company for the non-disclosure of data required for a technical evaluation of a field development prospect. Scientific In July 2015, Richard Stone wrote in the journal Science in July 2015 that if the agreement is fully implemented, Iran can expect a rapid expansion of scientific cooperation with Western powers. As its nuclear facilities are repurposed, scientists from Iran and abroad will team up in areas such as nuclear fusion astrophysics and radioisotopes for cancer therapy. Diplomatic in August 2015, the British Embassy in Tehran reopened almost four years after it was closed after protesters attacked the embassy in 2011. At a reopening ceremony Hammond said that, since Rouhani's election as president British-Iranian relations had gone from a low point to steady step-by-step -step improvement. Hammond said, last month's historic nuclear agreement was another milestone and showed the power of diplomacy conducted in an atmosphere of mutual respect to solve shared challenges. Reopening the embassy is the logical next step to build confidence and trust between two great nations. The BBC's diplomatic correspondent Jonathan Marcus reported that the nuclear agreement had clearly been decisive in prompting the UK embassy to be reopened, stating that British-Iranian ties have slowly been warming. But it is clearly the successful conclusion of the nuclear accord with Iran that has paved the way for the embassy reopening. Continued tensions after the adoption of the JCPOA, the United States imposed several new non-nuclear sanctions against Iran, some of which being condemned by Iran as a possible violation of the deal. According to Said Mohammad Morandi Professor at the University of Tehran, the general consensus in Iran while the negotiations were taking place was that the United States would move towards increasing sanctions on non-nuclear areas. He said that these post-JCPOA sanctions could severely damage the chances for the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action bearing fruit. On 8 and 9 March 2016, the IRGC conducted ballistic missile tests as part of its military drills.
with one of the Kadar H missiles carrying the inscription Israel should be wiped off the earth. Israel called on Western powers to punish Iran for the tests which U.S. officials said do not violate the nuclear deal, but may violate United Nations Security Council Resolution 2231. Iranian Foreign Minister Mohammad Javad Zarif insisted that the tests were not in violation of the UNSC resolution. On 17 March the U.S. Treasury Department sanctioned Iranian and British companies for involvement in the Iranian ballistic missile program. On 21 May 2016 Zarif, the foreign minister of Iran persisted that U.S. must take practical steps in the meeting with his New Zealander counterpart Murray McCulley. Iran-U.S. Prisoner Exchange Hours before the official announcement of the activation of JCPOA on 16 January 2016, Iran released four imprisoned Iranian-Americans Washington Post reporter Jason Rezaian, who had been convicted of espionage former Marine Corps infantryman Amir Hekmati, who had been convicted of cooperating with hostile governments Christian Pastor Saeed Abedini who was convicted on national security charges, and former Iranian infantryman Nozer Atollah Khosravi Rudzari, who was convicted of violating alcohol prohibitions, and awaiting trial on espionage charges in exchange for the United States' release of seven Iranian-Americans Bara mechanic Khosrau Afghahi and two Raj Faridi charged with sanctions violations Nader Modanlo convicted of helping launch Iranian satellite Sina-1 Arash Garaman convicted of money laundering and sanctions violations for exporting navigation equipment to Iran Nima Golstane, convicted of hacking and Ali Sabunchi convicted of sanctions violations and the dismissal of outstanding charges against 14 Iranians outside the United States. A fifth American student and researcher, Matthew Trevithick, left Iran in a separate arrangement. As part of the exchange, the U.S. government dropped charges and Interpol read notices against 14 Iranians for whom it was assessed that extradition requests were unlikely to be successful. Senior U.S. officials defended the agreement as a good deal for the U.S., but some Justice Department officials and FBI and DHS agents were critical because this disrupted the national counterproliferation initiative efforts to lure top Iranian targets into traveling internationally in order to arrest them. Continued criticism Shahi Hamid of The Atlantic wrote that the agreement had a narrow, if understandable, focus on the minutiae of Iran's nuclear program and T. He Obama administration repeatedly underscored that the negotiations weren't about Iran's other activities in the region, they were about the nuclear program. The U.S. government and observers noted from the time that the framework was entered into in April 2015 that the United States and Iran still find themselves on opposite sides of most of the conflicts that have pitched the Arab world into chaos and that the agreement was unlikely to cause Iran to become a firm partner of the West. The narrow nuclear non-proliferation focus of the deal was criticized by the agreement's opponents, who argued that the agreement was faulty because it did not address anti-Semitism and threats against Israel, hostility and rhetoric against America and the West in general, illegal missile testing supplying of arms to terrorist groups and efforts to destabilize ongoing conflicts in Syria and Yemen. In October 2015 the Wall Street Journal noted that Iran had recently carried out ballistic missile tests announced the conviction of Washington Post journalist Jason Rezaian launched military operations to maintain Bashar al-Assad's regime in Syria, and continued shipping arms and money to Houthi rebels in Yemen, the latter two actions fueling fears of a broader regional war. Israel, 
and Saudi Arabia expressed concern about Iran's ability to use diplomatic cover and unfrozen money from the deal to strengthen its regional position and that of its allies. Critics in Washington accused the Obama administration of having been duped by Iran and Russia into accepting a deal that was antithetical to American interests. Meanwhile, the administration was also accused of whitewashing Iran's failure to cooperate fully with the IAEA investigation into the possible military dimensions of its past nuclear work. In November 2015 the New York Times wrote, A. Anyone who hopes that Iran's nuclear agreement with the United States and other powers portended a new era of openness with the West has been jolted with a series of increasingly rude awakenings. Over the past few weeks, the Times reported variously that the Iranian had invited a Lebanese-American to visit the country and then arrested him for spying. The Ayatollah made a public statement that the slogan, Death to America, was eternal. A wave of anti-American billboards went up in the capital, a backlash by political hardliners began and the Revolutionary Guard intelligence apparatus started rounding up journalists, activists and cultural figures. State media circulated conspiracy theories about the United States, including that the CIA had downed a Russian civilian passenger jet in Egypt. Iranian and Lebanese citizens in Iran holding dual American citizenship were targeted for arrest on charges of spying, clothing manufacturers were prohibited from selling items featuring the American or British flags, and a state-sponsored demonstration was held outside the U.S. Embassy in Tehran on the anniversary of the takeover and hostage crisis in 1979. Business Insider reported that a variety of factors made it more likely that Iran's stance would Harden once the agreement was in place with one Iran expert saying that Iran's nice smiling face would now disappear as the country pursued more adversarial stances, and policy analysts saying that by negotiating the deal with the Iranian Revolutionary Guard Corps, Obama had made an investment in the stability of the IRGC regime. The National Review wrote that the U.S. administration's unwillingness to acknowledge any Iranian non-compliance had left the Iranians in control, and that the deal was undermining international security by emboldening Iran to act as a regional hegemon at the expense of U.S. influence and credibility. The Wall Street Journal editorial page editor Paul Gigo argued in February 2016 that Iran's prohibited missile tests, capture of U.S. naval personnel, and other provocations were a sign that rapprochement hoped for by Iran's Western negotiating partners was not going to happen, saying the government had no interest in accommodating U.S. interests seeking instead to humiliate the United States and spread propaganda. Shigo noted Iran's desire to be the dominant power in the Mideast and would work to promote instability there while using the nuclear agreement as a shield to protect from criticism of its imperialist behavior. James S. Robbins, an American political commentator and a senior fellow on the American Foreign Policy Council, criticized the nuclear deal as impotent because it does not limit Iran's ballistic missile program and UNSC Resolution 2231, which was adopted along with the deal, weakened the limits Iran's ballistic missile program that had been imposed by previous UNSC resolutions. On 4 March 2016 Oli Hainan N. former Deputy Director General of the International Atomic Energy Agency wrote, the International Atomic Energy Agency's most recent report on Iran's nuclear activities provides insufficient details on important verification and monitoring issues, and said that the report's lack of detailed data prevented the international community from verifying whether Iran was complying with the deal. On 20 March 2017, 
The Trump administration formally certified that Iran was in compliance with JCPOA, but added that the country will be subject to non-nuclear terrorism-related sanctions violations. On 9 November 2016 Deutsche Welle citing an alleged source from the IAEA reported, Iran has violated the terms of its nuclear deal. On 1 December 2016 the U.S. Senate voted to renew the Iran Sanctions Act for another decade. The future of nuclear agreement with Iran is uncertain under the administration of President Trump. The Obama administration and outside experts said the extension would have no practical effect and risked antagonizing Iran. Iran's Supreme Leader Ayatollah Khamenei President Rouhani and Iran's Foreign Ministry spokesman said that the extension of sanctions would be a breach of the nuclear deal. Some Iranian officials said that Iran might ramp up uranium enrichment in response. In January 2017 representatives from Iran P51 and EU gathered in Vienna's Palais Coburg Hotel to address Iran's complaint about the U.S. congressional bill. The Trump administration boasted that Trump personally lobbied dozens of European officials against doing business with Iran during the May 2017 Brussels summit. This likely violated the terms of the JCPOA which expressly states that the U.S. may not pursue any policy specifically intended to directly and adversely affect the normalization of trade and economic relations with Iran. The Trump administration certified in July 2017 that Iran had upheld its end of the agreement. The IAEA EU Russia and China have all affirmed that Iran is respecting the limitations on its nuclear program. The IAEA, the foremost authority on the matter, has repeatedly deemed Iran in compliance with the nuclear deal. The U.S. State Department has also certified that Iran is holding up its end of the bargain, and a host of experts affirm these findings. IAEA Director General Amano said that Iran is subject to the world's most robust nuclear verification regime. Dispute over access to military sites Ali Khamenei banned allowing international inspectors into military sites. Trump and his administration said that Iranian military facilities could be used for nuclear-related activities barred under the agreement. Iran rejected Trump's request to allow inspection of Iran's military sites. However, UN rejected Iran's claim that its military sites were off-limits to inspection. Denial of recertification On October 13, 2017 U.S. President Donald Trump announced that he would not make the certification required under the Iran Nuclear Agreement Review Act accusing Iran of violating the spirit of the deal and calling on the U.S. Congress and international partners to address the deal's many serious flaws so that the Iranian regime can never threaten the world with nuclear weapons. Brought to you by Wikivd.com Would you like to know more?